Meet Thomas Midgley Jr. During his lifetime, celebrated mechanical and chemical engineer and inventor, with over 100 granted patents over the course of his career. Many of his inventions were employed on a large-scale industrial level. In fact, between the 1930s and 1980s, you'd have problem to go through your day without interacting in some form with one of his inventions. He was hardworking, brilliant and accomplished. You could go as far as to call him a genius, role model and one of the greatest inventors of the 20th century. However, now, 70 years after his death, time has unfolded Thomas Mitchell's legacy and it turned out to be something quite different. One Man and Environmental Disaster The most impactful single organism in the history of the Earth's atmosphere. Those are some of the designations Thomas Midgley is receiving these days. Not one, but two of his inventions are serious contenders for the title of the worst and most harmful invention in the mankind's history. Thomas Midgley turned out to be a cautionary tale, which should be known and remembered. It shows us that even the most well-meant inventions can have a long-term, severely damaging consequences, which may remain unobservable until it is too late. Nowadays, new inventions are appearing all the time, and we perhaps should be very cautious of their application, because it is not worth it to use something that will improve everyone's well-being for a time. While that very same thing will be our undoing in the end. Before we jump into the story, I just want to clarify that I'm not saying that we should stop inventing things, but just that we should be cautious and vigilant with them. As for example, an inventor might even be aware of the potentially dangerous side of his invention, but he might not express it publicly so as not to harm potential sales. And after all, we are living in times in which one single invention can cause so much damage as to outdo all the benefits of all other inventions combined. Alright, on this positive note, let's get into it. In 1921, Midgley worked for a General Motors company, which by that time had spent several years trying to find a petrol additive that would reduce engine knock. If discovered, such an additive would be a big deal, as it would increase vehicle performance and fuel economy. After several years of failed attempts, Midgley tried to mix gasoline with tetraethyl lead, a chemical compound discovered earlier in the mid-19th century. And sure enough, the two seemed to be made for each other. It worked like a charm. Smelling an opportunity in the air, General Motors and two other large companies bonded together to form a corporation with only one goal. That was to create and sell as much of this magical juice as the world was willing to buy. And willing it was. Even despite the fact that people at that time already knew about the dangers of lead. Lead is highly poisonous metal, and there is a curious reason for why lead and some other metals are poisonous. After ingestion, lead gets absorbed into the bloodstream, and our body gets confused. It pretty much mistakes lead for calcium. Calcium is a vital mineral which our body needs in large quantities and it is indispensable in the building of our bones and in the functioning of our muscles. So when lead gets absorbed, it will be dispersed efficiently all over the place, just like the calcium would be, without any resistance whatsoever. And the worst thing is that our brain really likes calcium too. Mistaking a foe for a friend, lead will pass without the slightest effort to all the important places and will unleash havoc, damaging your brain irreparably. Among many other symptoms of the poisoning, there are blindness, insomnia, hearing loss, hallucinations, kidney failure, convulsions. You get the picture. In the 1930s, lead was already known to be dangerous, but somehow that didn't bother people much, as it was widely used in plenty of products. Food cans were sealed with lead solder, water was stored in lead lined tanks, or lead was sprayed on the fruits as a pesticide. Nonetheless, when the world learned about lead being added to gasoline, some concerns were actually raised. In 1924, Thomas Midgley participated in a press conference to demonstrate the safety of leaded gasoline. During the conference, he poured tetraethyl lead all over his hands, and then placed the bottle of the chemical underneath his nose and inhaled its vapor for 60 seconds straight, claiming that he could do this every day without suffering any harm. This claim was made despite the numerous cases of poisoning and even 15 deaths at the chemical plants of the corporation. And despite the fact that Midgley just spent few months resting and recovering after being lead poisoned himself. All concerns were just swept beneath the rug. Consensus pretty much was that as long as you don't drink the stuff, you'll be fine. Now, nothing was stopping the production of lead gasoline from ramping up. It was easy to produce, crazily profitable and hey, it really worked, it really stopped engines from knocking. So all engines were running on leaded gasoline, and perhaps they still would be, if it wasn't for this man. Claire Patterson, who is a real hero in this story. Patterson is an interesting character for more reasons. He made his way to history books by correctly measuring the age of the Earth for the first time. To measure it, he was using lead isotopic data, which made him stumble on something very concerning. All his samples were contaminated by insanely high levels of lead, often 200 times the height they were supposed to be on. Patterson managed to bypass this problem by creating a clean, isolated room, which was specifically designed to keep even the smallest particles from entering it. Such rooms are nowadays common for scientific research, but back then, he was one of the very first people to ever create such a place. 
1956, Patterson successfully measured the age of the Earth to be 4.5 billion years. Afterwards, he returned to the issue of the lead contamination. At first, he tried to learn all that was known about lead effects on humans. But to his amazement, most of the research done previously was completely unreliable. As it turned out, for the last 40 years, all the study of lead was exclusively funded by the manufacturers which used lead. And they pretty much paid scientists to show their own products in a good light. It was however obvious that there was an insane amount of lead in the atmosphere. And Patterson quickly realized that most of it probably came from cars. So the question was, how to prove it? His way would be to compare currently levels in the atmosphere with the levels that existed before 1923. That is when lead gasoline started to be implemented. However, no one kept a record of such a things at that time. Luckily, this problem had an elegant solution. In places like Greenland, snow never melts away completely, and it accumulates in layers year after year. Due to the temperature differences, the color of snow in summer is slightly different from color of the snow in winter. Thanks to that, informations about the state of our atmosphere, even as much as thousand years back, are very neatly stored and accessible with the right tools. And sure enough, Patterson found out that before 1923 there was almost no lead in the atmosphere. And since then, the levels have been climbing steadily up. Now 100% certain of the source of pollution, Patterson embarked on a crusade against leaded gasoline. This crusade would last for almost the rest of his life. By now, that is in 1965, original inventor Thomas Midgley was dead already for 20 years. But the roots of the industry's invention fat run very deep. Many of the richest American companies of the time were in the leaded gasoline business. Fight against them would prove to be a nightmare. Patterson was all of a sudden unable to acquire research funding. Ongoing research contracts started to be cancelled out of nowhere for no reason. Institutions that employed him would be offered a very generous funding sum if they let go of that one delusional employee. Even though he was the greatest living expert in the matter, he was being excluded from lead pollution conferences. In spite of all of that, and to his great credit, Patterson have never backed down. After 20 years of efforts, the United States banned sales of leaded gasoline in 1986. Almost right away the lead levels in the blood of Americans fell by 80%. However, lead is not gone altogether. In fact, it never will be. It's unfortunately not something that will just disappear. Everyone alive today has 625 times more lead in their blood than someone that lived 100 years ago. Last and final country to ban the sales of leaded gasoline was Algeria in 2021. Finally, and officially since the last year, you can't buy leaded gasoline anywhere on the planet anymore. And it was about time. Researchers found an almost surreal link between lead pollution and violence. This graph is showing the average lead levels in the blood of the preschool children between 1937 to 1988. And this graph is showing the average amount of violent crimes per 100,000 people between the 1960 and 2011. If we move violent crimes graph over the lead levels graph, the two seems to match. You could predict rather well how violent generation is going to be 23 years later based on the lead levels in the blood of the 6 years old. Violence is, however, a rather complex issue and a lot of different variables come into play, so the link between the lead poisoning and crime rate is considered hypothetical. Still, it fits very well with what we know from people that survive lead poisoning as they tend to often manifest higher instability and aggressive behavior. Hence, it is very likely that lead played at least some part in the increased violence of this period. If Thomas Midgley is not your least favorite inventor already, wait till you hear about his second contender for the title of the worst invention of all times. Because while his first invention managed to poison every living organism, his second invention was firmly and happily on his way to eradicate life on this planet. Without much exaggeration. Story of this invention starts with... Fridges. Those nasty bastards. Well, they used to be nasty bastards. Murderers nasty bastards, in fact. That's no joke. Fridges were rarely killing people. Whole families at once. You see, initially toxic and highly flammable substances like sulfur dioxide or ammonia were used to cool refrigerators. As long as they stayed enclosed, all was fine. But if they started to leak through eroding pipes, come the morning, the whole household could be dead. After one such incident, Albert Einstein himself set out to invent a new type of fridge. When the greatest mind of the time joins the fray, you know that the matter is serious. Unfortunately, and to the loss of us all, his solution was no match against Midgley's. Where Einstein tried to invent a whole new technology, Midgley was searching for a possible safer alternatives that could replace the dangerous substances in the refrigerators. He and his team developed a colorless, non-toxic and non-flammable gas called dichlorodifluoromethane, as well known as Freon-12. It was a perfect solution. Compatible with current technology of refrigerators, all it took was to replace the toxic stuff for the safe and harmless Freon and you are good to go. Never before and perhaps never after was an invention embraced so enthusiastically. 
Freon went to production in the 1930s and soon found plenty of other applications, even beyond fridges. Among others, as propellant and all kinds of sprays. However, perhaps most famously, it revolutionized air conditioning. Before Freon, air conditioning was not a widespread thing. But now, with safe and harmless refrigerant at our disposal, air conditioners started to appear everywhere. Like, for example, in the cars, for the very first time. Midgley was again regarded as a hero. And while with his first invention leaded gasoline, he perhaps was aware of the possible dark side of it, concerning his second invention, he and everyone else alive genuinely believed that Freon made the world a bit better place. And it remained so long after the Midgley's death. In 1974, after 40 years of widespread use, it was discovered that a nice and friendly Freon, from the next doors that always helps the elderly, seems to turn into a violent mass murderer once it finally reaches heaven. By heaven, I mean ozone layer of our atmosphere. The ozone layer is crucial for the life on our planet. It blocks the majority of ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. If it was gone, the intensity of the sun's radiation would be so strong that it would make photosynthesis in plants impossible. Plants can grow without photosynthesis taking place, so they would soon all die out, which would result in a complete food chain collapse. If not a full depletion of ozone layer but just a partial takes place, it still has severe negative consequences, like increased skin cancer rate possibility of the severe sunburn. Or people can even go blind, as our eyes are very sensitive and can be easily damaged by the increased UV radiation. The real problem is that ozone is not very abundant. If all of it was spread out evenly around our planet, it would form a shell just 3 mm thick. That's why it is so easily disturbed. And it so happens that Mr. Midgley, by accident, found the perfect ozone killer. It is estimated that one single kilogram of Freon can over time destroy up to 140,000 kg of ozone. What seemed at first as the perfect solution, turned out to be in fact the final solution in disguise. Relatively soon after this upsetting discovery in 1974, Freon started to be phased out and banned from using products like sprays that released it directly to the atmosphere. But it still could be used to areas enclosed in, like in fridges. Everything changed in 1985, with the discovery of an ozone hole over the Arctic. That freaked everyone out. In 1987, Montreal Protocol came to be, which is an international treaty designed to protect the ozone layer. The treaty was by now signed by every country on Earth and is considered to be the most successful international treaty in history. Luckily, it came soon enough. The ozone layer is now recovering, but it will take a long time. You see, Freon is rather durable. On average, it will float around for about 100 years, causing havoc all the time. It is predicted that it will take until 2070 before ozone returns to its former state before 1980s. So this is how Tim has Midgley poisoned the entire planet. Twice. But wait. There is more. Our genius inventor still has one more little invention to his name. This one delivered a rather poetic ending to his story. Four years before his death, Midgley contracted polio, which left him severely disabled and bound to bed. To lift himself up from the bed, he invented an elaborate system of ropes and pulleys. In 1944, at 55 years of age, Thomas Midgley became entangled in this device and was strangled to death by his own invention. This time, at least, no one else was hurt, except for the inventor himself. Story of Thomas Midgley and his, um, contributions remind me a lot about those fairy tales where the protagonist sells his soul to the devil for some momentary benefit and the deal is never really worth it in the end. With that exception that in fairy tales, the character always knows that he will have to pay for the benefits sooner or later. With something like Freon, we're just reaping the benefits for decades and only after 40 years we found out what the real price actually was or that there even was a price in the first place. Well anyway, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.